Quiet, please. Shh, quiet for the chairman, please. <laughs> now, in many of the speeches that I've given to the new right since it commenced, the best part of three to four years ago, one of my roles as a sort of culturally revisionist role, if you like, is to reinterpret and bring back from the past people who have been forgotten. Usually, because I'm bringing them back, I think uh, undeservedly so. For this talk, I'd like to talk about the great sage of Victorian England, who was a Scotsman called Thomas Carlyle. Hey. Thomas Carlyle, one of the greatest writers, thinkers and orators in print in British literature and British history. Carlyle has always interested me because of his rootedness in various forms of British tradition and is his melding them linguistically into forms that spoke to his time. The influence that he had over his era is quite extraordinary. One when bears in mind that he was trained for the Calvinist ministry but rejected uh, Christian faith in a very complicated and theistic sort of way but remained a profoundly religious man throughout his entire life and cultural creativity. Carlyle in his early years didn't quite know what to do with his life. He thought about uh, the Protestant priesthood and he's rooted in the Protestant tradition in a very radical and transforming manner. He also thought about being a mathematics lecturer and indeed was one for a short time. He then looked at literature and what he could contribute to literature but he didn't like fictional and poetic forms neat. He wanted to write about philosophical and historical matters, but in a way that was transmuted with a sort of religious energy and an aesthetic zeal. After an early work in mathematics that still exists in an amended textbook form in the United States, he began a long exploration of the cultural channel in the West that was to open up for him his own sensibility, that in turn would ramify with his Scottish and Calvinist roots. And this was German literature and German philosophical and idealist literature from the early part to the middle part of the 19th century. It is not an exaggeration to say that he opened up the British and in turn the English mind to Germany and to Germanic culture in his era, to such a degree that his reputation suffered a great deal during the 20th century because of his Germanophile nature. He corresponded directly with Goethe. He, one of his slogans was, close your Byron and open your Goethe. He uh, translated <coughs> Wilhelm Meister, one of Goethe's novels. He wrote four, he translated four volumes of German literature that were published one after the other and that dealt with writers like Richter and with uh, certain of the idealist schools such as Fichte and so on. In these writers, he saw actually, in these writers he saw a way to transliterate the spiritual yearnings that he felt in a way that could be communicated in a manner that could be understood and appreciated by his era. Born in some respects conceptually outside his era, like a seer and a prophet, he came in part to dominate it. It's a strange chronology whereby he begins as an absolute outsider and ends loaded with honours, many of which he chose to reject individually, at the centre of his culture, then to be rejected in the early part of the 20th century because of certain of the authoritarian precepts that he would come to adopt politically uh, in the later middle period and towards the end of his life. His first great literary work is the philosophy of clothes, or Sartre Rosatus, which is designed as an exemplification of idealist thought, an introduction of what might be otherwise an obscure or arcane area to English and British audiences, listeners and readers. Don't forget the number of people who could read fluently then was much smaller than now. And the tradition of one person reading to a group, the oral nature of literature, is extraordinarily important to Carlyle. Carlyle's prose style has never really been approximated to by anyone else. There is an extraordinary torrent of allusion and inversion and the use of the dash and the use of epigrammatic insights and a torrent of phrase and of persuasion nearly always related to a central philosophical idea that underpins the word or lies to one side of it. Carlyle was a religious thinker in a totally secularising manner, in that he spoke to modernity, he spoke to an age, age of capital and of machines, he spoke to an age of science, but he used the mechanism of the pulpit and the 
jargon and language of Knox, which he transmuted in his own mind into a living and sinuous and prosodic form of narrative that he made all his own. Carlyle's, it was called at the time, and no one really has ever written in that way since. In Sartre, he began to satirise nearly all known conditions, partly as a way of clearing the ground for what he thought ought to replace them at a later day. He also served, by virtue of that text, to introduce German idealist philosophy to an Anglo-Saxon and British audience. He also sought to play games with texts, introducing one narrative, one autobiographical fragment, then leaving it, describing religious experience, such as the one that he's believed to have had on the leaf walk, when he had what for him was a mystical experience, whereby he saw the interconnectedness of all things. Carlyle believed in the reality of God in all areas and at all times, and he believed that all things are interconnected with each other. But in a way, of course, he is reaching way back into the Western and the Greco-Roman tradition. Heraclitus, in his lost book on nature two and a half thousand years ago, believed that energy was the basis of all life and of all being and of all becoming, and that that energy was, in some respects, flame. And the idea of the interconnectedness of all matter, and that which describes it, and that which psychologically alludes to it, and that which could be said by certain human values to be above it, was part of Carlyle's vision. This is why he could write about cultural heroes, he could write about chartism, a movement of mass democratic and trade union related reform in the 19th century, which convulsed the masses of that era and ultimately led in part to the democracy we now have in the British Isles. He could also write about the slave trade. His most controversial text in many ways, which is not reprinted in the Penguin Condensed Carlyle, which people are very dubious about in certain respects, laws have been passed which means that even the title of that work I can't mention in a meeting like this. But suffice it to say, John Stuart Mill, his old (laughs) friend and rival, later on, wrote a riposte to it called The Negro Question. And so you can sort of um, adumbrate from that what Carlyle was saying and indeed what the title of that work was. Carlyle believed that life was hierarchical, but that hierarchy had to be based upon the principle of justice. This is why he's uncomfortable reading for the mainstream conservative tradition and for all forms of liberalism and accredited reform. His greatest work after Sartre was the multi-volume French Revolution, the first volume of which was burnt by John uh, Stuart Mill's servant. He was illiterate and thought it was just trash that had been sent to her master. So she thought, oh, this is interesting, and put the whole lot on the fire. You have to understand that what that means for a writer in the 19th century. There are no word processors. There are no, I'll stick it in this window and give this chap a disc to see what he thinks of it. The whole first volume was burned. This was a blow to Carlyle. It really was. When Mill came to see him, he was white, white as a sheep. And he should have been, to be frank. He offered Carlyle £100, which is a lot of money in the 19th century, to rewrite the first volume. And for a while, Carlyle was stuck. But he soon got into the nature of the work. The French Revolution... Um, is one of the most extraordinary books of the 19th century because for a moment we have to reposition ourselves in that time. For people towards the middle of the 19th century, the French Revolution was an unbelievable experience which had not, never mind revisionism, been assimilated into the knowledge of the middle of the 19th century. The terms left and right, most of the language and discourse that we use in contemporary politics all over the West originates from these extraordinary and tumultuous events Uh, which began with quite sort of um, mild origins towards the latter phase of French monarchicalism in the 18th century. The 19th century remained deeply worried by the chaos and revolutionary ardour and violence that was released at the end of the previous century. Carlyle, unlike almost all other historians who tend to adopt a prosaic, measured, stoical, Johnsonian period in language and in sensibility. History should not be written in white passion. History should not be written in a committed way. Committed not to one side or the other, but committed to the virility and vitality of the thing itself. History, in a sense, should be rather like the de- given to the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. It should be judicious, it should be slightly acidic, 